Good morning. This is Miss Barber here. We are now beginning Chapter 3. It is called The Applications of Differentiation. The first lesson of this new section is called Maximum and Minimum Values. Let's begin with the formal definition of these two terms. Suppose that f is a function with domain d and c is an element of that domain. f has an absolute maximum at c if f of x is equal to or less than f of c for all x an element of d. The number f of c is called the maximum value of f on d. Max value occurs at c max value is f evaluated at c. f has an absolute minimum at c if f of c is equal to or less than f of x for all x that's an element of the domain d. The number f of c is called the minimum value of f on d. Min value occurs at c min value is the function evaluated at c. Important to note, these values and whether they even exist can depend heavily on the domain d. Example, consider the graph of f of x equals x squared over various intervals. Find the minimum and maximum values if they exist. The graph of f of x equals x squared is a basic upward facing parabola. Let's do A. On the interval between negative 1 and 2, endpoints not included. Let's shade the portion of the parabola for this domain. Negative 1 is not included, neither at 2. However, portion of the parabola between those two not included endpoints are. Because the endpoints are not included, on this domain, f of x equals x squared has no maximum value. However, we see at the vertex, first there's a horizontal asymptote. It is also visually the lowest point of the graph on the domain. So we have a minimum value at x equals 0 and a minimum value of f evaluated at 0, which is 0. Part B, on the interval between negative 1 and 2, both ends included. Let's shade in the portion of the parabola that this domain encompasses at negative 1, but now we have a solid dot, and at 2, the corresponding y value is 4, solid dot, and we are interested in the parabola between those two included endpoints. Well, the minimum value hasn't changed from the previous. It occurs at the vertex. So we have a minimum. We can also express it as an ordered pair. 0, comma, 0. The x portion tells you where. The y portion tells you what. And because the endpoints are included, we have a maximum. And that maximum is the right endpoint circled. So that would be the ordered pair 2, 4. C, on the interval between 0 and 2, endpoints not included. So on the parabola, at the vertex, we have an open hole. And at the point where x equals 2, which would be the ordered pair 2, comma 4, we have another open hole. We are interested in the portion of the parabola between 0 and 2 
endpoints not included. What's interesting here is that in the previous two intervals, we had a minimum. However, in this interval, the lowest point is not included. So we have no minimum. And the highest point in that interval is also not included. So we have no maximum. Let's look on the interval from 0 to 2, where 2 is included, but 0 is not. In interval notation, you could write this as open parenthesis 0, comma 2, bracket. The 0 is not included, but the graph where x equals 2 is. And we look at the portion of the graph between 0 and 2, looking for the largest and the least values. Because the lowest point is not included, there is no minimum on this interval. But the right extreme point is included, and we'll have that we have a maximum value of f of 2 equals 4 at the place where x equals 2. Those prepositions are very important. At is the x value. Of is the function evaluated at the x value. E, on the interval from 1 to 2, endpoints included. In interval notation, we would write that as bracket 1, comma 2, close bracket. Let's shade the appropriate portion on the graph of the parabola. Positive 1 is included. That ordered pair is 1, 1, and so is positive 2. We are interested in the portion of the parabola between 1 and 2 with the endpoints included. Considering only that portion of the graph, we see that the lowest point, we have a minimum. And you could express that as the ordered pair 1, f of 1. And if you compute the 1 in the f of x equals x squared, you get 1, and 1 squared is 1. We have a maximum at 2 f of 2, compute f of 2 in the f of x equals x squared, and you have 2, 2 squared is 4. And finally, let's consider it on the domain of real numbers. What that means is for the parabola, it continues indefinitely upwards, both in the second quadrant and also in the first quadrant. What we see here is that on the real number domain, we have a low point, which is the vertex. So we have a minimum, and that occurs at the origin. But since the graph moves upwards in both ends, it has no maximum. Let's learn a few theorems and definitions. The extreme value theorem. Suppose f is continuous on a closed interval, a comma b, then f attains an absolute minimum value f of c at some c in that interval, and f attains an absolute maximum value f of d at some d in that interval as well. Let's observe. If the function is continuous, then it has both an absolute max and an absolute min in that closed interval. Like the intermediate value theorem, the proof of this theorem involves some subtle properties of real numbers and is best left for a later course. Examining the graphs in the last example, we see that extreme values occurred at either endpoints when they were in the domain or at locations 
horizontal tangents. We now consider local or relative extreme values. We say a function has a local maximum value f of c at c if f of c is equal to or greater than f of x for all x in some open interval containing c. And has a local minimum value f of c at c if f of x is equal to or greater than f of c for all x in some open interval containing c. Let's point relative maxes and mins for the provided graph. First, I'm going to mark, reading from the left to the right, we have a horizontal tangent line at the high point located in the third quadrant. That place is called a local max. We have a, another horizontal tangent line in the first quadrant, and you notice that in order to stay on the graph to move left or right, you move downwards. When that happens, you have a local max. Now let's consider the point in the fourth quadrant. It's a turning point. It has a horizontal tangent line. And in order to move from that point and to stay on the graph, you would have to move up. And when that happens, you have a local minimum. Let's look at the small turning points in the first quadrant, the last ones. We have a turning point, And to move from that particular turning point, you have to move down. And so we have a local max. We have a turning point to the immediate right of that. And that turning point turns out to be a local min. Now, I would like to call our attention to where we have another horizontal tangent line that's in the third quadrant. The interesting thing here is that if you were to take the derivative at whatever that x value is, you'd get zero. But notice, it's not a local max or a local min. Vermont's theorem. If f has a local extreme value at c, then either the derivative evaluated at c equals zero, or the derivative evaluated at c does not exist. Points c where the derivative equals zero or does not exist are called critical points. Example, find the critical points of f of x equals four x to the power of one third plus three times x to the power of four thirds. When looking for critical points, always start with a domain. Looking at this, we see that the domain of f is the set of real numbers. Why? Because no variables in the denominator and nothing under an even root. Now, to look for a critical point, we find the derivative. Let's begin. f prime of x is equal to, then we have four times, taking the derivative of x to the one-third, would be one-third x, and then one-third minus one is negative two-thirds. Let's take the derivative of the next term. Three times x to the four-thirds, bring the four-thirds down, x to the power of four-thirds minus one, that's four-thirds minus three-thirds, that gives us the fraction one-third. Let's write this with no negative exponents. So we will have 4 divided by 3 times x to the 2 thirds plus 4 x to the 1 third. 
Those threes cancel. In order to combine this, we need a common denominator. So let's multiply. And remember, if you don't have a fractional form, it's understood that you've got one under that expression. And to get a common denominator, I'll multiply the numerator and the denominator of the second term with 3x to the 2 thirds, which is the denominator of the first term. The first term is still 4 thirds x to the 2 thirds. On the second term, 4 times 3 is 12 x to the 1 third times x to the 2 thirds. 1 third plus 2 thirds is 1. And in the denominator, we get that desired common denominator of 3x to the 2 thirds. Now we can add these two terms. And the derivative is 4 plus 12x divided by 3 x to the 2 thirds. Critical values occur where the derivative equals 0 or where the derivative is undefined. Let's set the derivative equal to 0. We'll write 0 is equal to 4 plus 12x. That's because if a fraction equals zero, then the numerator must equal zero. The denominator cannot equal zero because if it does, then the function would be undefined. Solving for x, we would get negative 12x equals four. So x is equal to negative four divided by 12, one third for the derivative to be undefined. That would happen if the denominator equals zero. That is, if three x to the two thirds equals zero, solving for x is zero. We see that f has critical points at x equals negative one-third and at x equals zero.